there, Internet. I'm Annie. I'm Kit. And I'm Mac. And this is I Will Fight You, a podcast where we've been turning opinion into stone-cold facts since 1986. Today's fact, you can't polish a rhinestone. We're talking about Rocky Horror. We're talking about both screen versions of the Rocky Horror Picture Show at the same time. The new one is a scene-for-scene remake of the old one, so it's possible for us to do that. And uh, I actually have a confession for you guys now that we're recording this. Yeah. When I was looking to watch uh, Let's Do the Time Warp again, uh, I made a startling discovery, which is that Fox, who has a large, large share of Hulu.com, does not have Let's do the time warp again. The only way I could actually get it was if I bought it and put it in my library and owned it for $10 on Amazon. And guys, I don't know if I love you that specific kind of $10. (laughs) I kind of have a similar confession in that I found out the same thing. So I just watched the DVD copy of the original. I didn't watch the original one either, but I felt that was appropriate as the straightest person in the room. That... uh, (laughs) Rocky Horror remain an impenetrable mystery to me. Though, as the most theater kid in the room, I also find myself drawn towards it. I splashed out the 10 bucks to watch the damn thing. I also did not need to rewatch the original because I see it twice a year, every year, in the theater. (laughs) (laughs) This is incredibly appropriate. There's a group here in Edmonton called the Lowdown Cheap Little Punks who put on the showings uh, in May and October. There is this gorgeous old antique theater called the Garneau in my neighborhood. And twice a year, every year, we go in and destroy the place. I don't know why they let us keep doing this, but they do. And there is usually a costume contest and the prizes for the costume contest are uh, dollar store garbage. It sounds wondrous. <laughs> One time the theater's power browned out and while we were waiting for the projector to come back on, Luke, the MC, just stood up on stage and started reading off IMDB reviews of the Rocky Horror Picture Show as written by 13 and 14 year olds. Oh my god. <laughs> he had those prepared? Yep, he printed them off. Holy shit. That is a man who is prepared for anything. That's a prince who prepares. So yeah, I have this movie memorized. And to that end, because you were like the person I know who loves Rocky Horror the most, I was largely expecting you to sort of take the reins on this. So Yeah, I, I kind of expected this to be kind of like a the Chobits episode. <laughs> Where you explain why the new one sucks to me and Annie. (laughs) I at least know, you know, I at least know the plot. And I have been to a few of the live things, but I haven't been in it as as much um i went twice in college and then i haven't really gone recently and i've I've, i have watched it like eight times but not that much i've watched it a small handful like all of my friends are theater kids in high school and they could all sing much better than i could so uh, it was either that or rent and um i would not pick rent if (laughs) if it was either i watch rent and sing along with a whole room full of theater kids or my firstborn child is fed to rumple stilt skin. I would say goodbye to my baby. <laughs> so you've never seen it in the theater then? I went my freshman year of college. They were putting it on at the theater downtown. And Yeah, uh, that's where that's where I went during college. I don't remember much of that aside from it not leaving a gigantic impression on me. I feel like if you had been to a proper theater showing with all the callbacks and everything, then it would have made that impression on you. <laughs> it may have just been an off night. I mean, Mac, you can probably attest to whether or not it was quality most other times. Anyway, quick history lesson. The Rocky Rocky Horror Picture Show came out in 1975. It is a film adaptation of the Rocky Horror Show, which is a stage production. Both were uh, written by Richard O'Brien, who is the guy who plays Riff Raff in the movie. It is most notable for having Tim Curry as Dr. Frankenfurter and for also creating this culture around it because you see the movie flopped. It flopped really bad, but because it flopped, it was really, really cheap and it was bought up by a lot of college campus theaters. As a result, they would show it over and over and over again. And if you're a bored college kid, especially in a town where there's not a lot of like queer organizing spaces, you go and see the Rocky Horror Picture Show over and over and over again. And eventually this culture developed around it where you like bring prop kits and throw stuff at the screen and shout callbacks and sing along and dance. And it's very loud and it's very gay. And back before the internet, if you weren't sure what you were, you would just go to the Rocky Horror Picture Show and make out with people until you figured it out. (laughs) 
<laughs> so yeah, it is this great big part of queer history. And, you know, a lot of the younger generation of queer people is not particularly fond of it. And I can understand why, you know, in a modern context, you would look at this and go, this is not how we want to present ourselves to the world as a community. And like, but at the same time, it is a big part of our history. It was really all we had. There were very few queer movies. Like there were movies with gay characters in them, but Rocky Horror Picture Show was a queer movie. Queerness is the default. Heterosexuality is challenged. And I'm, I'm very fond of it, despite the fact that, yeah, a lot of this is not age well. If you if it went on as often as it did in theaters, and I can imagine that it was just like a marvel to have this regularly enclosed, safe queer space on like a regular basis. That must have been just revolutionary. And it was also like, you didn't necessarily have to be queer to show up. A lot of the like goth kids really, really like showing up to this thing as well. But uh, my mom actually used to go and it was through her that I learned about this movie and she drove me to my first Rocky showing. So thanks, mom. <laughs> Vicky remains spectacular. <laughs> If you don't listen to Gem Jammer, but you listen to I Will Fight You, just know that Vicky gets cooler all the time. Yeah. We went to Edmonton Expo together and like two people were like, oh, I love you on Gem Jammer to my mom. They should. Your mom fucking rules. She's the most brutal of all of us. She's hardcore. She is very hardcore. Anyway, in 2016, they did a remake sort of live. Was it live? I don't remember. Yeah, they, they trumped it up a lot of the live event. Yeah. Anyway, they reshot it uh, scene for scene, basically. With casting choices that uh, the technical term for it is star f***ing. <laughs> The most notable casting decision is uh, Laverne Cox is playing Dr. Frankenfurter, but there is also like a bunch of other like minor celebrities that I kind of recognize in this. I have mixed feelings about the new one because, you know, I had fun watching it, but there's a lot of moments where I'm like, this is kind of missing the point. And somehow it's actually less gay than the 1975 version. Okay, so the 1975 version of this, and this is iconic, like we will be chanting lips, lips, lips in the theater because it starts off with this great big pair of red lips on the screen, singing the opening song, which is science fiction double feature. And the 2016 version denies me the lips. What? <laughs> it is just some minor celebrity I don't recognize. Do they do they do like an extreme close up on that actor's like lips or anything? Or no, it's just this blonde chick in an usher's uniform wandering around between movie posters because otherwise the kids won't know what she's referencing in the lyrics. Right. <laughs> and also she's doing that thing where she throttles every goddamn note she gets. Oh, like when someone who can carry a tune decides that they're going to just go all out on the uh, United States National Anthem. That she wants to be Mariah Carey. Ooh, yep, exactly then. That's exactly it. I'm glad we could meet between our two cultures for this. This takes place in a theater, uh, and we get to see some of the crowd filing in for the showing of the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and they're just kind of like generic punk outfits. They are not dressed up the way people are for Rocky, which is to say I once saw a guy show up in like full kilt Outlander garb, but with fishnet stockings and stiletto heels. So is it like cosplay, or is it just sort of being the queerest that you can be? Kind of a mix of both. Some people show up as certain characters, and like I said, there's a costume contest at my local showing and there's like a general category for Transylvanians for just people who want to show up like the horrific outfit that they've managed to put together. Excellent. But uh, you can show up in costume as a particular character. Um, if you're brand new, you can show up in your underwear as Brad or Janet, or you can just show up and like dress in as much glitter and corsets and lingerie as you want. And a side note is that if you haven't seen it in the theater before, uh, you are officially referred to as a virgin and you get a red V drawn on your forehead and lipstick. Yeah, I remember specifically not having that happen to me at the one show that I went to. Oh, we got to fix that. Oh, do we? Don't worry. We're advised to be very gentle with the virgins. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we get to the end of this number and the usher lady sits down in the back row with a thing of popcorn and the movie starts up and we start up at the wedding scene. It is like shot for shot. The intro, it is the same with the exception that it's actually brightly lit. So is that is that a good thing? I don't think so. I think sort of like the weird bleakness of the 1975 version. And that may just be a, a factor of like time and age on the film stock. But like the weird bleakness kind of really contributes to it. it it's sort of like an Oz thing, right? You want everything to look as washed out as possible before, you know, the castle. This wedding just finishes. In the wedding party, we meet uh, our two heroes, Brad Majors, asshole, and Janet Weiss. The guy playing Brad is actually a pretty good Brad. He's really nailing the whole, like, 
awkward, stiff, kind of terrible acting sci-fi B-movie thing that can only really be done on purpose. I have an objection to the new version. Um, the new version has painted on the side of the car, uh, she said I do, now I'm doing. And in the 1975 version, it says uh, she got hers, now I'll get mine. And uh, <laughs> I gotta say, I like the old one better. <laughs> Although there is a, a grave of Mary Shelley in the cemetery while they are singing Damn It Janet. So there's that. So over the course of, of Damn It, Janet, Brad proposes. There's the scene in the 1975 version where as they're singing the song, there's a bit where they end up in the church and Janet starts walking Brad down the aisle and Brad very clearly has this like, oh shit, look on his face. <laughs> and that's not in this version. And I feel because it's not there, we've kind of lost something. Instead, they're farting around with a tree. What? Yeah, they're just dancing around a tree instead. Was that necessary? I don't know. But they decide to go and see the teacher of the class where they met. They decide to go and see Dr. Scott. And so they pile into the car and head off. And then we go to, in the 2016 version, Tim Curry playing the criminologist. What? <laughs> this is right after his stroke. So he doesn't quite have a lot of his diction back. But it's still Tim Curry. Aw, buddy. He has an assistant, like, holding up books for him and stuff. Good old Tim Curry. Tim Curry says he wants to take us on a strange adventure. How strange was it? It's so strange they made a movie about it. <laughs> That's a callback in the show. <laughs> you could recite this whole thing, couldn't you? Possibly. <laughs> so after this intro, we go back to uh, Brad and Janet driving through the storm. There's a bit in the 1975 showing where Janet's eating a chocolate bar. And one of the callbacks is she chews and chews and chews, but she never swallows. And then somebody else yells, Janet never swallows. Oof. Here's the thing. Rocky Horror Picture Show is an R-rated movie. The callbacks are NC-17. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard to navigate. <laughs> so Janet and Brad are driving through the storm. They see a motorcyclist go by. They start talking about life being cheap for that type, etc., etc. And new Brad's delivery on that is not bad. It's very clear once you really get into this that new Brad is one of the few people who knows what he's supposed to be doing in this. They hit a dead end. They decide to go back. And as they're backing up, Brad backs over something that blows out his tire and immediately starts lamenting that he didn't get that spare tire fixed. And the audience shouts, hey, didn't you see a castle a little ways back? And then Brad said, hey, didn't we see a castle a little ways back? So this is just a castle in the middle of like the United States. Then. Yeah, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh <laughs> And Janet says, oh, I'll go with you to the castle. And Brad is like, no, there's no sense in both of us getting wet. And there's a couple of NC-17 comments from the commentary. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. And then Janet says, well, for all I know, the owner of that castle could be a beautiful woman. And in the 1975 version where Frankenfurter is played by a man, everyone is like, oh, he is. <laughs> I feel I should clarify, Frankenfurter is a genderqueer character. So when I'm talking about Frankenfurter as played by Tim Curry, I'm going to use he pronouns. I'm talking about Frankenfurter as played by Laverne Cox. I'm going to use she pronouns. And when I'm talking about Frank and Furter as like an abstract entity, I will be using they pronouns. <laughs> that tracks. That sounds great. So when you hear me say he, I mean Tim Curry, not Laverne Cox. So up next is another song, There's a Light. And what's weird about this 2016 version is that they actually cut back to the audience every once in a while in the theater. What? To show off like some of the stuff that goes on in the theater showing. So for example, when Janet goes out into the rain and puts a newspaper over her head, everyone in the audience also puts newspapers over their heads. And that does happen in the theater showings, although there's also water guns involved hmm. because the theater owners are idiots. So they're trying to go for like a, hey, look, it's just like when people go do live showings of Rocky Horror, but like tamer? Way tamer because there's not nearly enough vulgarities being screamed at the screen. Huh. Anyway, they sing There's a Light and we get our first glimpse of Riff Raff as we approach the castle. And this one is played by, I think, Reeve Carney, who's doing a pretty good like Richard O'Brien impression, but his scene kid hair is terrible. Oh, he's got scene kid hair? He's got scene kid hair. But it's Riff Raff. <laughs> yeah. It's not even like period appropriate. Like Riff Raff isn't cool, but Riff Raff is cool. And in neither of these do scene kid hair come into play. Anyway, Brad and Janet go up to the door. They meet Riff Raff. We have an appropriately awkward interaction between the three of them, including Riff Raff staring at Janet and saying, you're wet. Hmm. 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 I'd be really enjoying this, except they really f 
fucked up the intro to the time warp. Oh? Like, Time Warp starts with this really, really good r- guitar riff, like, menacingly in the background before Riff Raff starts singing. And in the 2016 version, it's just, like, some random, like, country jangling before it starts. You don't get quite the same sense of anticipation right before Time Warp. Also, they gave Riff Raff a guitar. What? Fuck me. They gave Riff a guitar. Why does Riff Raff have a guitar? He is the guitar. I guess because Reeve Carney wanted a guitar. It's got neon lights on it. <sighs> Mm. Okay. Magenta here is being played by Christina Milian, and she's actually fun, but she doesn't get to do much. And then we burst into the ballroom during Time Warp, and, uh, oh boy. Oh? Okay, so, a couple things. One, the costumes here, basically, they're bad without being bad enough. They are visually confused. In the 1975 version, the Transylvanians all had a fairly uniform look to them, which was rather form-fitting tuxedos, weird glasses, and hats. In the 2016 version, all the Transylvanians are in really not matching outfits that kind of just look like they went through the dumpster behind a Halloween store. Actually, a lot of the costumes in this version look like they went through the dumpster behind a Halloween store. Two, there is a stage and a band performing. What? The stage and band are here throughout the entirety of the movie, and it bothers me. Huh. It fucks with the diegesis of the musical numbers, and I don't care for it. That's an interesting choice. I mean, there's a reason the orchestra is in a pit. Three, there's a freaking pride flag across the room. That's just on the nose. Here's the thing. As I mentioned, this version is like comparably weirdly heterosexual, and it's almost like a similar almost. Like, it's sanitizing this very, very queer thing for the consumption of the masses. So the presence of a pride flag just kind of is really egregious to me. In what way? Like, because it just seems like it's a very mainstream sort of nod? Okay, so the thing about the pride flag is that it has been sort of co-opted by corporations and governments that don't actually care about us and freaking cops and it has sort of inadvertently become this symbol of, like, supporting queer people as long as they're not too weird you know as long as they act like everybody else sure and also like you know banks having pride flags up in their windows while denying bank accounts to trans people and so it's sort of a crappy allyship sort of thing yeah it's in certain contexts it's a symbol of like assimilationism and crappy allyship which makes it the perfect visual metaphor for this version of rocky horror picture show honestly that makes a lot of sense pride used to be about throwing bricks at cops now it's about doing drag shows for bankers anyway also this ball room is tiny. It's teeny tiny. You do not get the same sense of like ominous space that you do in the 1975 version. Also, they overcomplicated the choreography of the time warp. I'm mad. But okay, jump to the left, up to the right, hands on hips, knees and tight, pelvic thrust. That, that's like five steps, right? They have people freestyling on that theme and it's bad. I don't like it. There's a, there's a diagram. It looks like they're all making it up as they go, which means that the sense of being in a room with a bunch of people who are moving perfectly in sync and you have no idea what's happening is just shot. It's gone. Wow, combined that with how you're describing the costumes that does not seem like a good idea it's kind of missing the point like the coherency is just gone they cut back to the audience a couple times during this as well and uh they moved the theater seats apart so it doesn't quite convey the appropriate level of awkwardness of trying to dance this very energetic dance while you're trying not to elbow the people next to you in the face (laughs) and then after that rad has his really really good line which is hey any of you guys know how to madison which i still love new brad did that very well and then they also f*** up the Frankenfurter intro. What? So in the 1975 version, this is a great big thing in the theaters because we start hearing like this rhythm bass in the background as you see the elevator coming down in the background of Brad and Janet arguing about how they should leave. And we get a close up on Frank's foot in the elevator in this really like ornate high heel platform shoe stomping up and down to the beat of the music and everyone in the theater stomping up and down to the beat of the music. And it's this great like lead up moment. And then Janet turns around and sees Frankenfurter and screams screams and faints and then Frank comes out of the elevator and starts singing Sweet Transvestite and it's really f***ing good. In the 2016 version, they couldn't afford an elevator. What? So they put her on a crane instead. What? And put her in like this great big weird sun-shaped Halloween mask, like really overboard, like from that episode of TNG. What? <laughs> oh God. And they've got her on a crane being lowered down behind Janet instead. And there's no stomping boot and there's no like backbeat to the music. And it's just, it's botched. It's utterly botched, this intro. How? That's the thing I remember the most from like the limited amount of showings that I've seen of this movie 
is that introduction? That's that's important. It's really important, and they botched it. But I will say, Laverne Cox is a really good Frankenfurter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's got the appropriate level of, like, menacing power bottom energy. Ooh. Her costuming's not good because they keep putting her in, like, basically Halloween costumes. All of her fishnets are, like, spiderweb Halloween fishnets. But she sings really well as Frankenfurter. I don't know if that's her natural singing voice. Her line delivery is really good. Her energy is really good. She's a great Frankenfurter. Oh, that's so good. Like, I had been kind of worried because it's so hard to follow up Tim Curry. Yeah, it is. Tim Curry is, especially in that role, is able to pull off this incredible amount of, like, sexual energy and also extreme threatening energy. Immediately, as soon as he enters the scene, it's like, you are 100% playing his game. There's no way you can really say no to this. He'll either kill you or have sex with you. Maybe both. And you're not sure what order it'll happen. <laughs> <laughs> He's just a tough act to follow, but if Laverne has your seal of approval, then I am all for her. She's not quite trying to do the same thing. Well, that's good, though. She's doing her own version on it, and it is good. I really like her as Frank. The directing choices surrounding her are a little questionable. And also, like, I have complicated emotions about a trans woman singing the lyrics to Sweet Transvestite. Yeah. Because, like, in Sweet Transvestite, Frank refers to themselves as not much of a man, uses some pretty outdated terms, although they were current at the time. It's a little weird. Yeah, that's the hard thing about Rocky. It was very much about its time and queer discourse has really changed a lot since then. Yeah, but I feel like if Laverne Cox was comfortable singing this, these lyrics, then yay for her. I still have complicated emotions about that. In an era where governments are saying that trans women are a threat, particularly to cis women, and that trans women are menacing and sexual predators, etc, 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 I don't think it's a particularly good move for a major television network to put on a production where a trans woman plays a sexually menacing predatory character. I think feel like that's maybe a bad choice. Yeah. In larger context, it's maybe not the best idea. <laughs> yeah, like on the minor scale, if Laverne was comfortable playing Dr. Frankenfurter, then more power to her. She was great. I didn't see that one. I saw the original. But yeah, on the grand scale, I can agree with that. There's the personal scale and there's the societal scale. But also, I'm very much in the camp of like, Rocky Horror Picture Show is not here to make cis straight people feel comfortable. No. But if they are doing this for like a mass market and broadcasting it on TV... Being mindful of perpetuating things that are like literally lethally dangerous to trans women is something to keep in mind. Do you think you'd rather have seen someone that is more male identified in that role and have Laverne Cox say in one of the other roles? Or is there just not a good answer to this? My understanding is that originally it was going to be Adam Lambert as Frank. And Adam was like, well, I'm a cis dude, uh, maybe. And then he actually put forward Laverne Cox's name, which kudos to him. And like I said, Laverne was very clearly excited to do the role. I think in general, it's okay to mess around with what Frank's gender identity is portrayed as. And like, I'm not saying that a trans woman can't play Frank because one has and clearly did a very good job. It's messy and it's complicated and there's like no real ideal way to do this. So anyway, that happened. That's tricky, but you know what? At least Laverne gave it her all. Yeah, she's really fucking good. And she does the, I see you shiver with Antissa patient. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> You did the thing! It goes on for like a little too long in the 2016 version, but it does have the audience shouting, say it, which we actually do in theater. So that was good. But she says that she's going to remove the cause, but not the symptom, which is, you know, Frank's cue to leave. Only she sticks around for like a couple more seconds after that. It's supposed to be a punctuation that Frank sings that and then vanishes up into the elevator again. But yeah, it's okay. There's a band on stage. Everything's wibbly wobbly. God, I hate that band. <laughs> We have the whole scene where uh, Brad and Janet get stripped down by Riff Raff and Magenta and Columbia being like, oh, you've been invited up to Frank's lab. Some people would give their left arm for the privilege. And like, new Columbia's energy is weird. Oh. She's very like dry and bored and all that. And I can appreciate wanting to do your own thing with the role of Columbia and not trying to mimic Little Nell's energy. But at the same time, it's kind of like, do, do you want to be here? <laughs> is someone coercing you into being in this show? Are you okay? 
<laughs> anyway, we go to the lab. We have Frankenfurter's speech about the spark of life, etc., etc., etc. It's weird hearing the speech in its entirety because this speech has the most audience yelling over it out of any other part of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. So I don't hear most of this because for the most part, it's stuff like, hey, Frank, who's your favorite Star Trek character? Right before Frank says, Spark. <laughs> I very infrequently heard the speech in its entirety, but here we are. And then we have like Rocky's whole Frankenstein birth scene, which in the new version involves Riff playing with like nipple buttons on the big control computer console thing, which, okay, huh. this this show needed titties. Well, straight people like titties. Every show really needs titties. The straight people are watching, gotta have some titties. Otherwise, what are they gonna look at? So in the 1975 version, this whole scene where like they Frankenstein Rocky to life, it's this really long, agonizingly drawn out thing with a lot of weird sound effects and dumb 70s special effects and everything like that. And in the 2016 version, it's been part of it, I'm sure, is a function of this being like a live filmed stage show. So as a result, they can't get like as experimental with the cinematography and everything. But uh, they've also streamlined it quite a bit and cut out most of like the extraneous like shots and everything, which means that like all of that weird tension from the original scene is gone and it's just kind of like a bunch of stuff that happens and then a dude pops out of like a soda casket huh also and i feel like this is necessary to point out rocky is an appropriately large and muscular dude but listen i gotta say this Putting Rocky in basketball shorts is homophobic. What? They put him in basketball <laughs> shorts. What? They're gold basketball shorts. What? Put him in the Speedo or don't fucking bother. Don't be afraid of testicles. First of all, how dare you? This fucking director is terrified of Rocky's bulge. But that's the point. Oh, and he's in like gold converse too. He's not barefoot, which I'm sure was like a health and safety thing, but ugh. Anyway, now we have the Sword of Damocles, which the guy playing Rocky is doing an okay job with. But like in the 1975 version, Rocky's voice is like weirdly low and muted and almost I suspect was dubbed in. And now it's here just like a dude singing and it's fine, but it's not quite the same. But he's doing an admirable job, even if Frank is not doing the appropriate level of screaming like a huge drama queen and running after him all over the place. <laughs> and after we're done the Sword of Damocles, Frank is showing off Rocky to everybody. There's a really great bit that I love in the uh, in the original show. Magenta and Riff and Columbia are all giving their feedback on Rocky. Riff and Magenta are appropriately fawning. Columbia leans over the edge of Rocky's fish tank and goes, he's okay. And then Frank like glares at her and the audience yells, okay, get your tits off my fish tank. <laughs> But that doesn't happen. <laughs> Columbia does say he's okay, but there's no 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 fish tank for her tits to be on. So, Aww. and then of course Frank shows Rocky off to Brad and Janet, and Janet is like, "Oh, I don't like men with too many muscles." And then new Brad looks right at the camera, <laughs> 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 which is really good. <laughs> Oh, that is pretty good. And then Frank is like, I didn't make him for you. And we go right into I can make you a man, which is notable for the fact that Frank is now of comparable uh, physical strength to Rocky. And so she ends up like picking him up and moving him around a lot, which I'm really enjoying. <laughs> You gotta wonder if when they did the remake, they were considering changing some of the lyrics around the whole Charles Atlas thing because they were like, oh, the kids aren't gonna get that reference. But Frank is displaying an appropriate level of thirst here, so that's good. And then in the middle of I Can Make You a Man, we, of course, get Eddie bursting in. And in the original, he comes bursting out of the freezer in the lab. Right. Because that's where he was because he got his head cut open and was left there for dead. In the 2016 version, he just busts through a window like Batman? Oh my god. What? Where was he? What? is he doing this it doesn't make it i realize there's a lot about the rocky horror picture show that doesn't make any goddamn sense but that one actually had there was like some through line there that, that was actually a through line is that like eddie is one of the few characters where you can pinpoint basically exactly where he is at every point in the movie which is to say he's in the freezer or under the table spoilers spoilers for a 40 year old movie <laughs> spoilers <laughs> <laughs> Eddie is played by Adam Lambert. He's actually a pretty good Eddie. I do have a quibble with like his head wound because like in this version, it's like this mild scar that you can barely see. And when Meatloaf is playing Eddie, it is this giant, bloody, shitty looking Halloween gash makeup thing right across his forehead. But Hot Patootie is still really good. <laughs> <laughs> Adam Lambert sings it really well. Even if he does jump on the stage that is in the lab for some reason, why is there always a stage in a band? Wait, do they do 
directly interact with the band in this version? Yes! <laughs> oh, that's weird. The band members are characters in this. They're what? That is very weird. I don't like that at all. Like I said, it's, it confuses the diegesis of the musical numbers and it bothers me. Adam Lambert is really good though. And then like at the end of it, Frank advances on Eddie and in the original, Eddie gets backed into the freezer and then Frank basically off screen hacks him to pieces with a pickaxe. Right. Here, Frank pulls out a little knife, stabs him like, once and then pushes him out a window so he gets a Disney death. Huh. It's the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah. Eddie's got to get hacked to pieces with a pickaxe. Huh. It's one of the most oddly sanitized things in this movie. Yeah, that's weird. Anyway, Columbia screams as usual. And then like Columbia's got this thing in the 2016 version where she's constantly sucking on blue lollipops. So there's actually this really cute bit where Columbia's screaming and then Magenta like pops a blue lollipop into her mouth and she stops screaming, just kind of wanders off. That's good. So after Eddie dies, quote Quote. We get a reprise of I Can Make You a Man, in which it's basically implied that Frank and Rocky are like symbolically getting married. Okay, so in the original version, it is Frank walking Rocky into his little like weird chapel bedroom thing. And then the last we see of either of them is like Frank hopping up to put his legs around Rocky's waist. Oh, yeah. That good, good power bottom energy. <laughs> and here it's just kind of like everyone piles into the elevator and then we cut to the criminologist. And it's Ugh. Again, it's sanitized. It's very sanitized. It's it just begs the question of why even make Rocky Horror like this at all. Yeah, why put it on TV? It's an R-rated movie. Yeah. And this ran in, I think, like a primetime slot. Yeah, we'll get to that. Anyway, Rocky Horror sex scene, take one. <laughs> Janet's trying to sleep in bed and then uh, a silhouette with Brad's voice steals into the room and starts cuddling up to Janet and being like, oh, this is so terrible. And then they start like getting really cuddly and I'm saying really cuddly here because like, again, this is very sanitized. In the original, it was like all silhouettes. So they were, they were able to get away with a lot in terms of like, they are very obviously about to have sex, but here it's just kind of like cuddling. It's cuddling. And then of course, of course, Janet very quickly realizes that this is in fact not Brad, but is in fact Frankenfurter. So wait, they only get so far as cuddling? It's some like handsy cuddling. So the great betrayal is that, oh no, she was cuddling. Yeah. When I say this movie is weirdly straight, only men ever kiss Frank. What? Frank only kisses men in this. There's like some homoerotic like posing and like faces pretty close together between Frank and women. But for the most part, it's really heterosexual. Brad gets really close to Frank and Rocky gets really close to Frank and that's it. But Rocky... I mean, at one point, Frank pushes uh, Janet's face into her boobs, but that's about it. So we have that. And then Janet does her whole, oh, no, I've never. Oh, no. And then, you know, <laughs> succumbs to Frank's wiles. Promise you won't tell Brad, etc., etc. Same old, same old. And then we cut to the scene where Riff Raff and Magenta just like mess with Rocky a bit. And in the original, it's them goofing around and then it goes wrong when Rocky busts out. Like it's the same thing where Riff grabs like a candelabra and like menaces Rocky with it. Also, like in the new version, Rocky is sleeping on some uh, towels in the in the garage like beast man <gasps> he's not sleeping in the weird chapel bedroom which i feel is like not appropriately communicating just how much frank likes rocky but okay but anyway in the old version it's like riff is menacing rocky with the candelabra and then rocky manages to bust out of his chains and run away in the new version it is very clear that magenta and riff are deliberately trying to chase rocky out of the house it's a weird, different energy. And also, where's the elbow sex? <laughs> Griff and Magenta have this move in the original where they like do a double high five and then roll it up so their elbows are touching. And the audience constantly refers to this as elbow sex. Wait a minute. They don't have that in the 2016? They do it once. What? They do it once and I got very excited about it. But for the most of this, anytime in the original that they had elbow sex, they aren't doing it. But that's their whole thing. It's egregious. Anyway, Rocky Horror sex scene, take two. <laughs> Brad is asleep in his room or trying to sleep in his his room and a silhouette with Janet's voice steals in. Oh, Brad, this place is so terrible. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, it's Frank again. And it's basically the same lines over again with Brad eventually succumbing to Frank's wiles. Although new Brad again knows what he's in. He knows what kind of production he's in. And there's this actually really funny bit where he's like clinging to the bedpost as Frank is like tugging on his arm trying to get him to come to bed. <laughs> it's really... <laughs> It's really something. And then the usual, oh, promise you won't tell Janet, blah, 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 etc. And then Riff calls in and is like, oh, Rocky has escaped. Frank is like, coming. And the audience is like, so's Brad. <laughs> 
So Rocky has been chased around the castle grounds by dogs. Okay. Janet is wandering the castle, lamenting her fate and doing a fairly okay job of it in the new version, although Susan Sarandon is still better. And then as Janet is lamenting things in the lab, she hears crying from the fish tank, or in this case, a soda case full of ice. And Rocky's in there and he's crying because he's been chased around the grounds by dogs. <laughs> I feel like that needs more emphasis. Where do the dogs come from? They just have dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, don't worry about it. Janet is like, oh, look, did they do this to you? I'll dress your wounds. And then she rips her skirt up and everyone's like, more wounds, more wounds. <laughs> and then as Janet is very shittily dressing Rocky's wounds, which is accurate to the original, it's just a real botch job. She starts singing Creature of the Night because she's sexually attracted to Rocky because everyone is, even though Rocky's wearing basketball shorts this time. Oh. <laughs> like, at least put him in boxer briefs. Don't be a coward. Don't be a coward. Now, in the original version, they just bang in the fish tank. Right. That's just a thing that happens. In this version, they actually go back to Janet's room. What? While they sing Creature of the Night and two major complaints. First off, they've sanitized this really badly to the point where, like, Rocky barely touches her and they're just jumping around in the bed instead of banging. What? Huh. They replaced a softcore sex scene with jumping around in the bed and playing airplane. Oh my god. It's pretty bad. But she wants to get dirty. Apparently jumping on the bed is dirty. Oh, Janet. And also they auto-tuned Creature of the Night. Oh! Oh my god. It's pretty bad. Although Columbia and Magenta are still watching on the security monitors, so that's fun. At least there's that. Although at the end of Creature of the Night, they say congratulations, Janet, even though they haven't banged yet. <laughs> <laughs> so they do that in Janet's room, which makes the fact that they're later also banging in the lab a weird digression, but okay. And then we, of course, we have Frank hitting Riff Raff with a riding crop and screaming at him about how Rocky got away, which is always a good scene. Although it's a cat of nine tails in the 1975 version, and I feel like that's better somehow. I don't know. As Frank is screaming at Riff about the fact that Rocky got away, they look on the security monitors and Dr. Scott has entered the building and uh, Magenta let him in as they're talking about, oh, we know this guy. He's trouble. He'll be in the Zen room. And in the 1975 version, we actually briefly cut away to the Zen room and like Dr. Scott picking up a joint with a pair of tweezers and squinting at it. <laughs> In the 2016 version, we don't cut away to the Zen room, and that is just egregious. I don't like it. Oh, but that's good, though. Also, in the 1975 version, like, they turn on an electromagnet that immediately pulls Dr. Scott's wheelchair, like, up the stairs and around several corners to the lab, and it's really fucking good. Right. And in this version, they just go and they fetch him in the Zen room, and that's just, it's, what, what are you doing? Oh. I appreciate it's probably a limitation of the fact that they staged this thing live, but what are you doing? You think they could at least pull him across stage? Like, you could set up some fish line that people could barely notice. Anyway, in the 1975 version, Dr. Scott busts through a wall Kool-Aid man style. And in, the, in this version, he just gets escorted into the room. And then Brad shouts, great Scott! And then the entire audience throws toilet paper at the screen. This does happen in the theaters. And the theaters are idiots for letting us keep doing it. Oh, because <laughs> Scott brand toilet. Yeah, okay. Toilet paper is not easy to clean up. We destroy that theater. We utterly, it looks terrible by the time we're done with it. It looks like a nightmare. We just TP the whole fucking thing. Yeah, toilet paper is really not easy to clean clean up at all. It is not, especially once people have stomped on it and gotten it in the water gun puddles from earlier. Oh, god damn it. It's gotten to the point where, like, as you're leaving, you can earn, like, free movie passes from the theater if you stick around to help clean up. <laughs> Anyway, Brad and Dr. Scott catch up. Dr. Scott did not know that Brad was here. He was here to uh, investigate some stuff, specifically that he works for the government investigating UFOs. Why not? New Brad does not seem as surprised about this as old Brad was. Then there's some sex noises from the fish tank. And, oh, look, it's Janet and Rocky. And then we have the best part in the whole movie, which is Janet, Dr. Scott, Janet, Brad, Rocky, Bullwinkle. <laughs> Janet, Dr. Scott, Janet, Brad, Rocky, Bullwinkle. <laughs> Janet, Dr. Scott, Janet, Brad, Rocky, Bullwinkle. <laughs> and then that's over. Does the audience say Bullwinkle in the 2016 one? No. Oh. No, they don't. Oh. Probably they couldn't do it because Bullwinkle's like a trademarked character from another thing. Whatever. Yeah, but I mean, what is the going rate for the rights to Rocky and Bullwinkle right now? <laughs> uh, they did not spend a dollar more on this than they needed to. 
<laughs> and then, of course, Magenta rings that fucking gong and says dinner is prepared. And her delivery on it isn't nearly as weird as original Magenta's, but it's still very good. And it's definitely accentuated by the fact that afterwards she just kind of drops the gong on the ground and walks away. <laughs> and then they go to the dining room for the dinner scene. And the fact that this is a live show means that they're just seated like it's the Last Supper all on one side of the table. This is another scene that's like weirdly streamlined and as a result, it kills all of the tension. Like in the original, there's just like a lot of wordless stuff. There's like an interminably long scene where Frank is carving pieces off the roast with one of those electric carving knives. This version of the scene is just like weirdly streamlined, but it does have the addition of Columbia looking at the camera and saying, I hope it's not meatloaf again. <laughs> Which, okay, that's cute. For the kids at home, Meatloaf played Eddie in the original, and why that's funny will become very apparent in a couple of minutes. Womp womp. And then Frank puts on the party hat, and everyone puts on their party hats, and the audience puts on their party hats, and then Frank says, a toast, and then the audience throws a whole bunch of toast at the screen, uh, not in the film version, but in the actual theatrical versions. You throw toast at the screen when that happens. Frank sings happy birthday to Rocky, but just gives up halfway through, and so everybody else keeps singing happy birthday a little bit longer than she does, and it's all very awkward and I love it. So like the weird tension of the scene is why this next bit works because Dr. Scott asks about Eddie and then Frank says that's a rather tender subject and then looks at the roast. Brad gets it. Janet gets it. Columbia gets it. Rocky doesn't get it. <laughs> and then Columbia screams and runs away. But without that like weird tension of every shot going on just that little bit too long, the reason Columbia screams and runs away is not apparent, which is that they're eating Eddie. That's the joke. He's meatloaf. And then Dr. Scott turns to the camera and said, I knew Eddie had fallen in with a bad crowd. And then in the original version, that's when the audience shouts, who the f are you talking to? And in this version, Brad actually leans into the shot, looks at Dr. Scott, and then looks at the camera and says, Dr. Scott? Like, who are you talking to? That Brad does sound really on point. We then get the song for Eddie, where Dr. Scott sings about how Eddie was a, a low-down, cheap little punk. At the end of that, Frank rips the tablecloth off the table, and we have a dead Adam Lambert in the table with the dumbest expression on his face. He also does not look like he's had a rose carved off of him, which is not great. Well, he got that, like, light stab wound. And then Janet screams and dives into Rocky's arms, and Rocky holds her, and Frank is like, Oh, Rocky, how dare you? And then starts chasing Janet around the castle. And this is Planet Schmanet Janet. And I can understand why they decided that it would not be appropriate for Frank to be smacking Janet around as much as they do in the original for a number of reasons. <laughs> I still kind of wish it had happened <laughs> because the menace here does not quite work if like Frank is just sex posing at Janet throughout the entire number. She's supposed to be screaming and getting chased around the castle. New Janet does not scream nearly enough or how I pitched enough for this. It's not working. Susan Saranda does it better. And then anyway, we get to the lab and everyone's chasing Frank who's chasing Janet. And then the machine in the lab gets activated and glues everyone to the floor. Scott starts going on about how, you know, they've created this vibrating transducer, which leads the audience to start making jokes about how it's a vibrator. It's a better vibrator. It's the perfect vibrator. Vibrators in space. <laughs> in the theater version, not in the 2016 version. Aww. And then they all get medusified, which in the 1975 version turns them all into statues, but because they were shooting this live in 2016, all it does is create a glow special effect, and then everyone has to stand really, really still for the next couple of minutes. That's tricky. Columbia does get her, like, monologue against Frank, either, even though we don't get to see her nipple this time. That's right. There wouldn't be any nipples in this, would there? No, nope, no nipples, which is weird because now we go to the floor show and the floor show is supposed to be a tits out operation. Yeah. Columbia and Rocky aren't in corsets and Janet's wearing a bra. What? Like I said, the floor show is supposed to be a tits out operation, like across the board. It's not. But everybody's in corsets. Nope. Rocky's in just some kind of like circus strongman outfit and Columbia's just in like a leather jacket and some leather pants and they've all been spray painted gold. Is he still in his basketball shorts? No. But the wrestling leotard he's in isn't much better. Cowards. Cowards! So they do rose tint my world. The lack of corsets and feather boas for Columbia and Rocky is really glaring. And Rocky's entire, like, number is entirely too masculine with too many pelvic thrusts. And then we go to new Brad and oh my god, is he working this shit. He's in a corset. He's got a feather boa. He's spray painted gold. He's doing a lot of really good stripper dancing. It's very <laughs> good. Aw, Brad. I'm enjoying him greatly. And then we go to Janet, who's boring. And then it turns out that Frank still has, like, her band and backup dancers. 
characters, that's not good. At this point in the movie, it should be very clear that Frank is just like alone, is this weird hermit in this big empty castle with like a couple of manservants and she's like putting on a bunch of weird shows for no one but herself. <laughs> but no, the band is still there, I guess. That is weird. After Rose Tint My World, we have Don't Dream It, Be It. As Frank is standing there dressed up like Fay Ray, the audience is normally is supposed to shout, hey Frank, ask a stupid question. And then Frank says, whatever happened to Fay Ray? <laughs> Laverne Cox is doing a decent version of Don't Dream It, Be It. Even though she is, like I said, she does have a piano, she does have backup singers and like a band and everything like that. And it's not like this weird hermit singing to no one but herself. And and then, of course, she jumps in the pool, and instead of the thing in the original version where Frank jumps in the pool and his makeup is immediately ruined, and his outfit is immediately ruined, instead Frank jumps in the pool and we cut away to just her floating in an inner tube in like a vintage bathing suit. Everything's still perfect. The makeup hasn't run at all. Columbia and Rocky and Brad and Janet all jump in the pool and they're, I want to know what setting spray they use because their makeup isn't going anywhere either. <laughs> and then there's a brief moment where like Rocky and Brad almost kind of make out and then they don't and I'm very disappointed. Like I said, this is weirdly heterosexual. And then it's time for Wild and Untamed Thing and we just cut away to Frank being out of the pool singing that song and she's got backup dancers again and her makeup is perfect and her hair is perfect and her outfit is perfect and it's just, Frank is supposed to be a mess at this point in the movie. Right. It's too polished. It's not shitty enough. The whole point of Rocky is that it's supposed to be a rhinestone. It's supposed to like have this veneer of respectability but to look absolute garbage. Tim Curry was red-eyed and covered in smudge lipstick at this point and, and Laverne Cox is just perfect. She's perfect. Nothing is out of place. Like Frank is a total wreck at this stage. Like emotionally speaking too, the visual of Frank being a visually a wreck matches the fact that Frank emotionally is just a wreck who has completely lost control of their life, especially their servants, because this is where like Riff Raff and Magenta bust in and be like, hey, this is a mutiny. We're going back home. F you. And in the original, like at this point, Frank is visually a mess and like small and vulnerable and wet and cold and like screams in response and is like curled in on himself and like terrified of Riff and magenta but in the new version Frank is like standing with her hands on her hips and being like very confident and not at all disturbed by this fact and it probably doesn't help that she's surrounded by like her backup dancers still. Hmm. She at never point loses her confidence or loses control of the situation so I do not buy at all that she's lost control of her subordinates. As a result there's no emotional arc to this whole sequence. It's just a series of musical numbers that are very confusing because you cannot see that emotional through line. Anyway, it's time for I'm Going Home which, again, Tim Curry was sort of singing this as a scared, insecure lament. Laverne Cox is just kind of singing it. It's just a number. She's basically just performing on a stage. This is not, there's not an emotion behind this. And then Riff points out, no, Magenta and I are going home. You're staying here in spirit anyway. New Riff's delivery on that is very good. Say goodbye to all of this. Buy all of this. <laughs> Say hello to Oblivion. Hello, Oblivion. <laughs> <laughs> First one to scream gets it right between the tits and Columbia screams and she gets it right between the tits and she dies. <laughs> Frank finally, like in the new version, shows some insecurity and screams and tries to run away and gets shot after Frank is dead. In the original, there's like this really great sequence where like Rocky goes full King Kong and like picks Frank up and puts him on his back and climbs up the like shitty fake radio tower on stage and then gets shot and then it falls over and they both fall in the pool. But no, we don't get that. Instead, what we get is like, the guy playing Rocky just kind of picking Frank up and then putting her in the great big King Kong palm on stage and then trying to charge Riff and then getting shot. Huh. It's not the same. It's not evoking the same thing. I mean, it's it's gotta be the King Kong thing. However, the next part, which is Magenta pointing out, hey, why did you kill them? They always liked you. And then Riff screaming, they never liked me, is still very good. <laughs> <laughs> he delivered that perfectly. And then we finally get some elbow sex. Elbow sex! Here, now, in <laughs> this late hour <laughs> and i did cheer and then riff and magenta are like okay we're beaming the castle back at the fuck out and they get the fuck out brad and janet sing superheroes which they're singing it standing up having stumbled out of the castle and that is not a song that should be sung standing up that should be a song <laughs> sung while writhing on the floor covered in makeup and dirt <laughs> and blood i just do not buy that these people are so wrecked by this experience that they are questioning their entire, like, lives up to this point. I do not buy it. And then we go to Tim Curry delivering the final lines of the show. 
And then we cut to the credits and movie, you can't win me over by showing me double lips. I won't fall for it. <laughs> it's just two sets of lips singing a reprise of science fiction double feature. So it sounds like this has a couple of glimmering moments, but overall, it's just kind of a mess. The thing is, it's not even really that it's a mess. It's too polished. It's not enough of a mess. The real charm of the Rocky Horror Picture Show is that it was all kind of very sloppy and slapdash and weirdly shot and weirdly directed and weirdly acted. And like a lot of it came together into something that was beautiful in its trashiness. Basically, the new Rocky is not nearly trashy enough. <laughs> Especially that emotional arc with Frank with the smudged lipstick and the running makeup and the constantly ruining outfits by being soaked and the being small and insecure and scared. That emotional through line is kind of what makes that whole end sequence work and it's just gone because they polished it away. It's just so odd to choose to repackage something that is so wildly not heterosexual, wildly independent, and to say, let's put that on a primetime slot on television. <laughs> On one of like the major networks in North America. Let's just let's just put it on there. On Fox, especially, on which Fox, is which um, is known for having run The Simpsons for like twice as long as it's actually been good. And is let's say somewhat right of center, politically mm. speaking. Yeah, just a scotia. So yeah, overall, Rocky Horror Picture Show, let's do the time warp again. Laverne Cox is good. Adam Lambert is good. New Brad is good. The whole thing is like way too polished and way too weirdly hetero. Yeah, it sounds like it. Putting a pride flag in the ballroom is not going to change that. Not to say that it was bad, because it was very well performed. It just missed the point. It missed the point of why people like Rocky Horror Picture Show. That sounds fair. They figured as long as they crammed all the musical numbers in there, and as long as they had famous enough people playing some of the parts, that people would like it just as much as they liked the original. And they didn't understand that that was not the case. What people liked about it wasn't the actors and, and the musical numbers, although that's certainly part Part of it they liked the fact that this is a deeply weird deeply trashy movie <laughs> on purpose because Richard O'Brien wrote Rocky Horror Show as a love letter to all the shitty sci-fi B-movies of his youth. Also then he played the weird villain in the last five minutes of Ever After. <laughs> and then he also played like the King of Thieves in that really bad Dungeons and Dragons movie. I yes. love that movie! <sighs> so yeah, I have a lot of strong opinions about Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> you feel better after, after getting some of them out? I do. You can't polish a rhinestone. You just end up with some broken glass and the appeal is gone. Kid, I am so glad that we finally got to this topic. I've been waiting to hear your thoughts on this for about a year. I got to take you guys to Rocky at some point, like a proper Rocky showing. Is that a threat? Yeah. <laughs> Guys, I think we've officially proven our thesis here, our fact. This entire episode is basically my master's thesis. Thank you for coming to Kit's TED Talk. <laughs> so with that, I think it's time for our final facts. Kit, what's your final fact? Stop wearing basketball shorts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm declaring a blanket ban on basketball shorts. They're atrocious. Stop wearing them. Mac, what's your final fact? More movies should just include everybody f***able. That's all they want. More movies with just like a highly bangable cast. Yeah, exactly. Annie, what's your final fact? It's okay when things aren't for you and listen to other people for whom they are. And also, God damn it, why isn't Rocky in a Speedo? Those basketball shorts are homophobic. I'm saying it now. Join us next time when we'll be giving thanks in the month of November with the absolute fact that a bad dub is almost as good as a good dub with... The best dub that you may or may not have ever heard of, Garzy's Wing. Which, by the way, it's all on YouTube. You should watch along with us. You should definitely watch along. I Will Fight You comes out every three weeks, wherever you download podcasts. If you want to help us out, a like, comment, review, subscribe, wherever you find our podcasts are extremely helpful. They help our metrics and uh, help us plumb the depths of our individual darkest places i'm still in like rocky horror callback mode so i was about to make a joke about plumbing the depths of your place but <laughs> i appreciate your discretion i don't i'm sorry i'm just in that place right now <laughs> Go get some aftercare. I need to come down from it. If you want to help us with money, you can do that on patreon.com slash the gem jam. For a couple bucks a month, you can support both this and our other projects. If you want to find us on social media, we are at gem jam cast on Twitter and crooked Russian cam .com on, you guessed it, Tumblr. Join us next time when we will be discussing a Garzi's wing. And until then, dear listeners, I'm Annie. I'm Kit. And I'm Mac. And we have fought you.